Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Pain, Pain Meds, and Falls in Older Adults, a Rock and a Hard Place. This is the first webinar in the Managing Meds and Minimizing Risk, What You Can Do webinar series. Today's webinar is facilitated by the Loop Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Michelle Dukeman, and I am the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Before we begin, I just want to get started today uh, with a land acknowledgement. Today, we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we live and work as the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Indigenous, Indigenous people, Canada's First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people, whose presence reaches back to ancestral time. We respect and affirm the inherent rights and title of Indigenous people of Canada and declare our respect of Indigenous elders, past, present, and future. I would ask that everyone takes a moment to themselves to acknowledge the land where they currently reside. Next, I'm gonna cover a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, if you have questions about technology uh, or you have comments to share, please type them into the chat. My colleague Marguerite will be monitoring this. If you have questions for our presenters about the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A box. They'll be answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, you will only be able to view questions you have asked and not questions posed by others. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about a week along with the presentation slides. Uh, and you can also view previous webinar recordings simply by heading over to the webinar page on Loop uh, and clicking on Loop Re Webinar Rewatch. Uh, you can visit Loop's YouTube channel as well. I would like to now introduce our presenters, Dr. Shirley Huang, uh, Medical Director of Geriatric Medicine Clinics at the Ottawa Hospital, and Derek Dykes, Pharmacy Specialist in Geriatrics at the, also at the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, for a complete bio on our presenters, please take a look at the Loop event calendar or the Zoom invite. Uh, and without further ado, please take it away, Shirley. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. Um, Michelle, can you see my slides? Yep, seeing just the slide. Okay, perfect, thank you. No um, yes, it's a pleasure for us to be here to present on this important topic today. Um, before we begin though, um, Derek and I, we have a couple of, uh, uh, one warning and one disclaimer. Uh, one warning is that we are presenting from the Ottawa hospital and sometimes you hear over here announcements like cold blues and stuff like that. Rest assured, we're totally fine. We might just uh, pause our microphone for a few seconds and uh, wait for the announcements to pass before we continue our presentation. So hopefully that will not happen. Um, the next, uh, second, uh, the second disclaimer is that, um, you know, Derek and I, we are not pain medicine specialists and we do not work in a specialized uh, pain clinic. Uh, however, we do both have uh, experience looking after older adults with comorbid concerns um, of pain and falls. And we want to share with you today our approach to addressing pain considering the presence of fall risk. Um, so um, and we do not have any conflict of interest to disclose. So here are the objectives uh, of our presentation today. I will start with discussing why do we care about pain and falls, what pain can older adults have, and how to manage pain without causing more pain. Um, and uh, Derek will take it over for the second part of the presentation, focusing on which medications are used, which medications should be avoided, and which medications can be associated with increased fall risk. So I hope the statistics on this uh, slide is not a surprise to uh, the people uh, in the audience. Um, we all know, know that falls are not part of normal aging and a significant number of older adults fall each year. Um, many of them can sustain serious injuries and falls can also lead to increased mortality in older adults. And certainly it is a very uh, significant cause of loss of independence. So we know that over a third of older adults uh, who are, have been hospitalized uh, after a fall, they may be discharged long-term care afterwards. Um, falls are also costly to the healthcare system. 
Um, at the individual level, falls can lead to chronic pain, loss of confidence, fear of falling, depression, anxiety, activity restriction, and social isolation. And so we know that falls can significantly affect the quality of life of older adults. What about pain? Why do we care? Well, unfortunately, it is very common in our older adult population and is definitely not part of normal aging either. Um, no matter what kind of study you look at, whether it's age-based study or studies based on you know, where people reside, um, you can see a significant number of older adults report that they're living with some level of pain uh, at some point um, in their life. And uh, certainly it is associated with many negative health consequences, such as impaired physical function, falls, poor appetite and sleep, depression, anxiety, as well as some cognitive uh, negative effects as well. What is the relationship between pain and falls? In fact, in actually a, a given year, older adults living with pain are more likely to report one or more falls than those living without pain. And uh, a meta-analysis of 21 uh, studies has shown that pain is actually associated with increased odds of falling, uh, in particular, having pain in the feet, chronic pain, uh, or severe chronic knee pain and back pain. So in particular, chronic knee pain and back pain are both associated with increased risk of having multiple falls. How may pain increase fall risk? So there are several known mechanisms that, that could potentially be contributing. One certainly is that lower extremity joint pain can affect uh, range of motion of the joint and altering the stepping and weight bearing pattern. So when a person is walking, they may not walk with a normal gait and it can affect their balance as well. Um, some, study, some studies actually show that multi-site uh, musculoskeletal pain is associated with slower gait speed, increased gait variability, slower foot reaction time as well. So what that means is that, for instance, when you're stumbling and about to, to lose your balance and, and, and maybe fall, you may take you know, a quick extra step to right yourself and to stop your fall and recover your balance. However, people who are living with multi-site musculoskeletal pain, um, it's been shown that they actually don't have a, as quick of a reaction time to take that extra step to correct their own balance. Uh, pain can also increase fall risk by leading to a person to reduce their activity level. So some people think that, oh, because, because it hurts when I move, I better not move. And what that can uh, cause is muscle deconditioning as well as joint stiffness. And when the muscle is weaker and the joint is stiffer, when you do try to move again, you actually can have more pain in that situation. So really pain causing reduced activity level can set up a vicious cycle that ultimately does increase a person's fall risk. Some people living with pain can develop depression, anxiety, and if they do warrant uh, pharmacologic treatment for those conditions, those medications targeting mood can also be associated with increased fall risk. And certainly use of high risk analgesia to treat pain is associated with increased fall risk. And this is something that Derek will go into more detail um, in the second part of the presentation. So what pain can older adults have and why? So the interesting thing about older adults reporting pain as a symptom is it's a more complex situation than somebody coming in saying, I have a cough or I have diarrhea. Um, because pain is actually definitely subjective, but it's not just about the sensation of pain. Um, it's actually about the pain experience. So the pain experience is what the patient says it is. It's subjective, um, but definitely has four main components that's important for, for healthcare provider to know, and as well as important for older adults themselves to know because they may not realize this is, these things are part of their pain experience. So the first part is nociception. So what that means is that there is some sort of tissue damage somewhere on the body, and that is sensed by uh, special nerve fibers, and that's that uh, signal is transmitted to the central nervous system. It is processed and um, perceived as pain. Um, however, there's also the negative emotional response to the pain, so that's called the suffering. But the challenge is that, you know, a, older adult living with other conditions such as other medical comorbidity that's affecting their quality of life. They can have um, challenges in, in terms of interpersonal inter, uh, relationships or living with base, uh, pre, pre um, uh, depression, anxiety. All those other uh, factors can affect a, a person's a level of suffering with their pain um, uh, sensation. And then lastly, last part of the pain experience is the pain behavior, which is the 
you know, grimacing, the limping, or the activity restriction that happens when somebody is uh, experiencing or living with pain. So it is important to understand that a pain concern, you know, reported by an older adult actually can involve all these aspects to make the pain experience quite complex. And unless if you understand this and really delve into you, you know, the factors that's affecting their pain experience and target, those, uh, target your treatment plan to those factors, then you may not actually be you know, providing adequate treatment for their pain. One thing that's very uh, important to know is that nociceptive pain means when there's tissue damage and that's detected by nerves and sensed by the central nervous system is one kind of pain. But if the pain is coming from nerve damage themselves, so it's the nerves themselves are damaged, then the perception of those pain can be quite different by, by um, our body. And not only that, um, the intensity of the nerve pain can actually be quite disconnected to external observable pathology. So nerve pain is you know, really another sort of uh, 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 significant pain that older adults can experience that could be quite different uh, from a nociceptive pain. I also want to touch on acute versus chronic pain. So acute pain is pain that happens with identifiable temporal relationship with a causative mechanism. So um, I stepped on a nail and you know, it caused a puncture wound on my toe, so it hurts. Uh, but oftentimes the acute pain may start to resolve even before the wound has completely healed. Um, chronic pain often happens meaning pain that is persisting beyond the normal duration of injury or the tissue damage or that it's associated with a progressive underlying disease process. And typically it lasts more than three months and has um, more of a psychological and functional features as well in the person's pain experience. So what about the pain experience and the normal aging process? Um, studies have shown that there are complex changes in nociception and perception part of the pain that happens with aging. Um, and certainly there are psychological factors as well that affects an older adult's pain experience. Um, interestingly, in, in certain aspects, um, you know, with certain aspects of these sort of, you know, neurochemical changes, pain nociceptive uh, senses and perception of pain, um, older adults may actually have uh, less pain uh, in the presence of some serious illness. So in some cases, absence of pain does not equate to absence of serious illness. So what that means is, for instance, older adults are more likely to, silent, to have silent heart attacks, and sometimes they can have uh, peritonitis, which is a very severe inflammation inside the abdomen that could be, you know, a, a, an emergency, but they may not actually have uh, abdominal pain that's associated with it that leads to delayed in diagnosis and treatment. Uh, however, there are other studies that shows that, you know, there are actually uh, uh, some changes in the um, pain threshold with aging. So for example, um, in the cases of uh, what we call short duration acute pain, older adults may actually have a higher pain threshold. So that means, for example, if an older adult accidentally put their hand on a hot plate, they may not sense pain as quickly as a younger person would and may not remove their hand from the hot plate as quickly. And they may actually you know, result in a greater burn on their hand. So their pain threshold in that sort of acute short duration uh, noxious stimulus may actually be increased. So it takes a greater amount of tissue damage before they feel that pain. There are also other studies that show that there could be a, a greater sensitivity to noxious stimulus causing pain, because of decrease in the inhibitory pain control uh, uh, pathways. What about the psychological factors with aging? Um, some older adults feel you know, that they're, 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 they're reluctant to report pain. They don't want it to seem, you know, they don't want to feel like that's you know, expressing weakness. They want to seem to be stoic in the face of pain, while others may actually you know, feel that they're less tolerant of pain for whatever reason. Um, and certainly there is a common misconception that pain is part of normal aging. So some people feel that, well, there's nothing that can be done about it. So they are suffering in silence, despite the fact that the pain is really affecting their sleep or their function or their quality of life. Um, and I've heard many of my patients who tell me that they have pain, but they don't want to become addicted to pain medications. So they do not want treatment, even though the pain is actually, you know, causing significant to negative consequences for them in day-to-day -day lives. Um, and lastly, you know, there are also altered pain processing uh, in the central nervous system uh, with aging. So, for example, loss of serotonin, glutamate, GABA, and opioid receptors. And these changes may have implications in terms, 
of uh, pain processing, but also the type of pain medication that can be uh, more or less effective in older adults. So what are the main types of pain that an older adult can experience? So one is the nociceptive pain, which is uh, basically there's tissue damage and that is sensed by some uh, nerve, uh, special nerve fibers and then processed in the central nervous system. And the most common causes are really osteoarthritis of the joints or in the spine and uh, compression fractures of the spine. Um, there are also not, uh, neuropathic types of pain, which can be quite common, which is when the nerves themselves are damaged. And some common examples are uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, uh, post herpetic neuralgia, which is uh, the pain that a person can get after they've had a, a bout of shingles, um, as well as a pain from spinal stenosis. So when the, the spinal cord is compressed due to a narrowing of the spinal canal. Um, now, what's important to know about another thing that's important to know about neuropathic pain is that they can also have some unusual phenomenon that can happen. So there's something called allodynia, which is, um, you know, a, a normally fairly mild and non-noxious stimuli in the affected region can be perceived as really, really painful. Or there's something called hyperpathia, which is repeated stimulation of damaged nerves can actually result in the summation of these nerve signals and that the pain persisting for a long time, even after the tissue damage has resolved. Um, or even after you know, the initial stimulus has gone away. So, so there are some interesting features of neuropathic pain. Um, the last category is called nociplastic pain, which is pain that's not fully described by either or above uh, situations alone. Um, and that's due to altered nociception and central pain modulation without any actual or threatened tissue damage and without evidence of lesion that's causing pain. So one common example of this is fibromyalgia. So now that we know that there could be different kinds of pain happening at the same time in the same person's body, as well as the fact that pain experience is actually affected by other uh, aspects of their health, we need to do a comprehensive evaluation of the pain concern before you know, deciding on the management plan. So part of the comprehensive evaluation of any uh, presenting complaint from a patient is always you know, re uh, rooted in history taking, physical examination, and investigations. Um, and in history taking for pain concerns, it is very important to know the location of the, the, the painful area, the onset duration, temporal pattern, as well as the frequency of the pain. Um, it is very important to elicit information such as the qualitative description of the pain. So ask the older adult to, you know, put the sensation of pain in their own words. What does it feel like to them? And uh, the words that they may use to describe nociceptive pain may be very different from the words they use for uh, neuropathic pain. Certainly the severity of the pain we need to elicit. Um, and one common scale is the numeric rating scale. So from you know, scale one to 10, zero being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you've had in your life. Um, you know, how much pain do you have right now or how much pain do you have you know, doing various activities? Um, it is important to know the aggravating and relieving factors of their pain because these can often give you clues about the etiologies of the pain or the potential management options. So for example, Older adults living with osteoarthritis of the knees, they often say that they have pain whenever they're going from sitting to standing up or when they're climbing upstairs or when they are you know, doing a bit of a squat to pick up something on the ground and then they have to stand up again. And that's when they really weight bear through those knees and, and that's when the knees really hurt. So that's one way that osteoarthritis of the knees can often present. And um, relieving factors are also useful. So for example, people with uh, lumbar spinal stenosis pain, they will tell you that they don't have as much pain or they don't have any pain when they're sitting down or when they're standing uh, with their trunk slightly forward flexed. So for example, when they're walking in the grocery store leaning against a shopping cart, um, and that is because um, a full reflection of the upper trunk actually causes the spinal canal to open up a little bit and causes less compression uh, on the spinal cord itself. So these kind of aggravating and relieving factors for the pain really can give you clues about you know, what could be causing the pain and what are the suggestions you can make for lifestyle modification that can help relieve the pain as well. 
it is important to know the comorbid medical conditions that a person also has that can affect uh, their health. Um, for example, we know that you know a person with underlying depression and anxiety um, can also affect their level of suffering with their other health conditions. It is important to know, for example, if somebody has severe liver or kidney diseases, because that can affect what kind of pain medications that we can safely you know, give people. So uh, understanding comorbid medical conditions is important. Um, therapies tried and the outcomes of those therapies. So it is important to know what older adults have used or try to use for their pain and whether they've helped. I've had lots of people tell me that acetaminophen or Tylenol does not help their pain. But when you really dig a little bit deeper, they may say that, you know, I've tried one or two tablets of this type of Tylenol a couple of times and it didn't help to take away my pain, so I stopped. It doesn't help me. However, it is important to, to provide um, your patients with education about pain management. So sometimes milder pain medications may need to be dosed adequately to an adequate frequency in order to help uh, reduce the pain. And sometimes even though a mild pain medication may not help to remove the pain completely, it may help to reduce the pain to a certain level that it is more tolerable or allow you to you know, have a reduced need for a stronger pain medication like a narcotic that can have uh, a more serious side effect. So even you know therapies that have been tried, they say it didn't work. It's it's helpful to know really you know whether it was an adequate trial or not. And if something has been tried and it really did not help, then then you don't have to waste your time and, and ask them to try it again. And lastly, it is important to know the impact of pain on a person's day-to-day -day function, mood, and quality of life. Um, and certainly, if you want, you can use some validated um, uh, uh, functional scales out there to assess their day-to-day -day function. For example, the CAS Activities of Day Living Scale or the Lawton Instrumental activity, Activities of Day Living Scale. Um, or you can simply you know, uh, uh, ask a really thorough history about you know, how does the pain affect you when you're dressing yourself, bathing, you know, trying to walk and trying to do housework, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, after you've taken a thorough history of, of the pain uh, experience and um, you, know, you, you have some idea of what could be causing the pain and what are the potential options for treatment, you definitely want to uh, ruin or rule out your differential diagnosis by having a thorough musculoskeletal and neurologic system examination, as well as um, using some investigations to help to confirm diagnosis or exclude more serious pathology. Um, it is very important to, to, for you, uh, to realize that actually if you do CT or MRI spines of many or most older adults, you will find some sort of pathology such as spinal stenosis or degenerative disc disease. Uh, however, um, most of the time these older adults may not actually have pain. Um, so therefore having abnormalities in the imaging finding does not necessarily mean that that is the cause of their pain. And so you want to choose uh, investigations very carefully to see if it, you know, if it, to, to, to figure out if it will actually be useful to you or not in, in, in ruin or rule out a diagnosis. So once you've had a thorough clinical uh, evaluation, you want to figure out, you know, how, what is the management plan for this person's entire pain experience, right? Um, and um, usually with any treatment, we want to figure out what is the goal of treatment. And a lot of times, you know, uh, people say, you know what, I want to be pain free, but that may not actually be realistic because in some situations to be pain free means that the person needs to be on very high doses of uh, you know some really high risk pain medications that can have you know serious side effects and and in that case you have to weigh the risk and benefit ratio of these uh, pain medications to see if you know is if, if being pain free is actually a realistic goal um, oftentimes, I try to counsel my patients that, you know, in weighing the risk and benefit, it may be more, more realistic to um, use, you know, improved functioning and decrease uh, suffering or making the pain more tolerable, tolerable so you can still function through the day as being, you know, the goal of pain management, rather than saying, you know, we have to try to get you to be a pain-free state. Um, so setting uh, expectation right from the beginning is really important before you come up with a management plan. And just like with treatment of any medical conditions, um, you want to think of both non-pharmacologic therapies as well as pharmacologic therapies. And I usually encourage people to consider non-pharmacologic therapies first, because there are many that can be helpful and certainly do not have the, risk, the same risk of side effects uh, compared to pharmacologic therapies. 
Uh, so, you know, in terms of physical interventions, there are many out there that are available, and I listed, you know, quite a few of them here. Um, certainly, like adjusting posture and daily routines can be helpful in terms of decreasing the severity of pain. For example, as I mentioned, you know, people with spinal stenosis, they may want to sit down to prepare their meal rather than standing up and uh, causing an aggravation in their back pain, or to use a walker or, or a shopping cart when they're in the store uh, so that they can lean on it a little bit, and that can relieve, you know, their back pain as well. There are uh, devices out there that can reduce pain or support day-to-day -day functioning. For example, a knee brace or back brace uh, can also help decrease pain in these areas. And certainly there are assistive devices out there that can help people perform their day-to-day -day function better uh, as so as to not to aggravate uh, their pain. So having a good uh, uh, evaluation by an occupational therapist can be really, really helpful because they're the specialists that can help you look at your day-to-day -day functioning and suggest adaptive devices that can help. Um, and definitely, um, you know, seeing a physio physiotherapist to review, you know, different physical interventions, including exercise or, um, you know, other therapies, hydrotherapy, etc. These can all be helpful because exercise has been shown to decrease pain, improve function and mood. Um, hydrotherapy is particularly helpful for people with uh, uh, arthritis or pain in their weight-bearing joints, such as hips and knees. And, um, you know, it is worth trying these diff different physical interventions first, and also concurrently, um, even if after pharmacologic interventions are needed. Um, ultimately, you know, some people might need surgical intervention, for example, a joint replacement surgery, if they have fairly severe and painful and debilitating arthritis of the knee and hips. And, and, and oftentimes that's, you know, surgeries are more invasive and they are used as a last measure for, uh, as, a, as a pain management strategy. And since we know that the pain uh, experience is, is, you know, can include uh, uh, the, the, you know, the psychological factors, the emotional suffering, as well as the pain behaviors, then we want to consider useful psychological interventions to target those aspects of the pain experience as well. So studies have shown that cognitive strategies can be helpful uh, in terms of, you know, decreasing the amount of, of, of emotional suffering a person can get from their pain. Um, and basically the idea is, is to help, you know, a person to modify their beliefs and attitudes so that they can go from being a passive victim to the pain to becoming an active manager of their pain. Okay, sorry about that. That was a cold stroke, not a cold blue, uh, but it's over. Um, anyhow, I'll continue. Sorry about that. Um, and then the behavior strategies um, are important because they target the pain behaviors. Um, so this is based on the principles of upfront conditioning, which is you know really discouraging pain behaviors, using positive uh, reinforcement for non-pain related behaviors, and for achieving preset goals. So behavior strategies have been shown to increase activity reduce analgesic use and improve mood as well. But unfortunately, in some people, you know, pharmacologic treatments are still needed. Um, so I will let um, my colleague Derek uh, to take over for the next part of the presentation. All right, I'll share my slide here. Great. Okay. Just, uh, Shirley, you can uh, sleep, see my slide there? Yep, I can see it. Yep. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, so um, many of you have are familiar with the World Health Organization's um, pain ladder, which basically is an attempt at a, a, a practical approach to pain uh, management. Um, it was originally developed in 1986 that for um, with the intent of addressing cancer pain. And this one that I have up here was a, a reboot, as it were, um, for um, back in uh, 2010 um, that uh, to address the chronic uh, non-cancer pain as well as uh, neuropathic pain and how um, 
the intent is to, you start with the least offensive uh, medications, the non-opioid analgesics uh, and the NSAIDs uh, before you move on to step two, which would be the weak opioids and then onto the strong opioids and, the, uh, and then the more invasive um, measures, including nerve blocks and things like that. That's for the chron chronic non-cancer pain and for acute um, pain, things like uh, post-op, um, you would go in reverse. You start with um, more intense therapy and then work your way down as the patient heals. Um, and uh, all along the uh, way on either side, you, um, there's a role for adjuvant therapies, including uh, antidepressants, uh, the gabapentinoids, um, uh, cannabinoids, and as well, um, steroids. Um, the American Geriatric Society also has published uh, guidelines originally in uh, 1998, and it's been updated a couple of times in uh, 2002 and 2009. Um, it, this is just to be aware that the, these exist. They're, they're a good read if you want to look them up. Um, that's the title of it, The Pharmacological Management of Persistent Pain in Older Persons. Um, pharmacotherapy is the, the focus of it since it's the most common strategy used and, and does carry the highest risk as compared to the non-pharmacological uh, interventions that um, Dr. Wong described uh, earlier. Um, and they are consistent guidelines and uh, consensus guidelines. So the reason for that is that the current evidence-based literature can't really be extrapolated to this patient population. Um, and what are the commonly um, encountered situations, like certain disease states and um, or ethnicities. The, in, in, in general, and the studies have uh, usually included younger, uh, younger patients than what we're uh, concerned with. But if, looking at the World Health Organization and the AGS um, guidelines, there are the common principles to follow. Um, whenever possible, use oral uh, formulations, um, use the gut when you can. Um, the analgesics should be given on regular intervals for the chronic persistent pain. Analgesics should be prescribed according to what the pain intensity is and evaluate, as evaluated by a scale uh, of intensity of pain. So like objective uh, measures that are out there. Um, dosing of pain medication should be adapted to uh, the individual. Um, it's not just a, and it should be um, prescribed with a uh, attention to detail. It's not like a set it and forget it type of thing. It should be constantly monitored and adjusted as indicated. Um, this is just a reminder that um, as we age, um, there are changes to our body that can impact how our body handles the medication um, and how our body responds to the medication. Um, as we age, there's less muscle and more fat, which is important um, because for lipid soluble medications, they tend to stick around longer, have a longer half-life. And for water soluble um, medications, there's less total body water. So there's gonna be, a, for the same dose that you would have, there's a higher concentration and therefore increased risk of toxicity. Um, there's decreased renal and hepatic clearance of medication. Um, so you can build up in your system and um, the metabolites can build up. And, and there's also lower levels of protein in the blood, which is important for protein bound uh, drugs um, because if there's less protein, then there's a lot more floating around in your serum. Um, and that's the component that has uh, the efficacy as well as the toxicity. If it's bound to the protein, um, it's not causing you any trouble in general. So overall, so basically what this leads to is in general, uh, elderly people need lower doses or at longer intervals uh, between doses. So what are, we're looking at um, medications. What are some of the medications used for pain and which ones, uh, which is why we're here, which ones can increase fall risk? So looking back, we'll go stepwise um, through the, the pain ladder there. The first one, the uh, is acetaminophen. Uh, the most common brand you would see out there is Tylenol. Um, it's well tolerated and safe in the elderly. It's uh, inexpensive, uh, which is a plus. Um, and the regular is covered. The regular formulations are covered by uh, ODB. Um, 
they're, effic they're efficacious for uh, osteoarthritis and for low back pain. Um, we want to max, the maximum dose is four grams a day, but if the patient is taking it on a chronic uh, basis, uh, we aim for three grams a day just because uh, there has been incidences of hepatotoxicity with the, uh, the higher four gram dose. So if they're taking it regularly, we leave it at uh, three grams, unless of course they have uh, significant alcohol intake or liver disease, or if they're malnourished, then we aim for even lower of uh, two grams a day. Uh, the good news is that uh, overall, there's no increased fall risk um, with acetaminophen, <clears throat> which, um, which is a plus. But you have to be careful because as many of you have probably seen in the pharmacies, there's a wall of different uh, products available. Not all of them are um, uh, straight uh, acetaminophen. There are ones with muscle relaxants in it, decongestants, antihistamines, um, sedatives. So not only are all those other ingredients um, uh, putting our patients at an increased risk as far as like falls and uh, cognition, but also there are also hidden sources of acetaminophen, which could easily put you over the, uh, the limits um, that is applicable for that patient. So that's just something to be aware of. As well, it's over-the-counter, um, as I mentioned. So if it, it's not prescribed, a lot of patients don't consider it um, to be uh, important to mention when, uh, when they're uh, talking about their medications. So you have to delve deep for that. So next uh, on the list is the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, some examples would be ibuprofen, naproxen, and diclofenac. Again, some of these are available over the counter as well. So the same uh, cautions apply uh, as for the acetaminophen. Uh, how they work is they inhibit the prostaglandins. There are more effective than acetaminophen for uh, chronic inflammatory pain, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. And they're also good for the like, short-term use of, for um, osteoarthritis and for low back pain, studies have shown. Um, but there are risks associated with it. Uh, cardiovascular, um, they can, you know, exacerbate uh, heart failure and, uh, and increase hypertension, um, not by a lot as far as for the hypertension goes, which you may have heard in the, uh, one of the previous webinars with uh, about naproxen, um, but it, it is still a risk. Um, and as far as uh, GI goes, um, there are risks for, um, causing reflux or increasing reflux, but more importantly, uh, ulcers and GI bleeds. Um, and finally, their risk to the, uh, the kidneys can uh, exacerbate uh, or cause uh, renal failure or, or decrease renal function. So it's something to be aware of and you have to weigh those things with uh, when you're looking at these medications. Um, as far as falls go, there are conflicting studies. But overall, the trend is towards an increased risk. Some of the studies were non-significant, but, um, um, but the trend is uh, to, that they do increase the risk of falls. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have to, you should avoid it in, in pre-existing heart failure. Um, but um, one of the good things about NSAIDs is that there are topical options um, like um, drops or uh, gels. Um, um, mostly it's uh, diclofenac is the, uh, the agent that uh, is included in those and they are over the counter. Um, and there are um, the, the topical options are over the counter and they're not covered by ODP. So that's a, a factor as well, but a lot, I find a lot of uh, patients uh, find they, they do help, whether it be like a, almost a placebo effect with the uh, the rubbing action on the spot, or if the the uh, actual anti-inflammatory properties, and push comes to shove, if it works, then it works. <laughs> That's good. Um, oh, and so overall, for insights, there are uh, uh, over-the-counter and prescribed products. So it's just something to be aware of. So another um, subset of insights are the uh, COX-2 selective insights. Uh, uh, so examples of those would be the meloxicam and the celecoxib. Um, they are, the reason the, the, they came up with these was because of the risks associated with the NSAIDs. 
So it was an attempt to minimize um, those adverse effects. Um, so what all the post uh, marketing studies have shown is that you know they're they're pretty comparable as far as efficacy goes, and there's fewer GI adverse effects um, with the COX two inhibitors. But it's not a like a you're not completely off the hook. It's just a less uh, risk. Um, but there is a, a a higher risk of cardiovascular events with the COX-2 inhibitors. So you really have to be careful um, in choosing these medications, uh, take your individual patient into account as uh, to so what their history um, and comorbidities are. So you um, make the right choice for, for the patient. Overall, uh, they're, they're pretty risky drugs to use in the elderly and we have to be monitoring them and taking their histories into account and using for a short period of time uh, as possible. So next are the opiates, which um, are used quite a bit and there's a wide range of different opiates um, that can be prescribed. Um, there's, uh, according to the scale um, or the, uh, the, who, the who ladder there, it's intended to start with the weak opioids. So codeine is uh, probably one of the more common ones. Um, the problem with codeine is that there's a very high risk of constipation uh, associated with it. Um, and also it requires conversion to morphine to be active. They, it's a called it's a pro drug. So codeine itself doesn't do anything. Your body converts it to morphine, which is what uh, how you get the analgesic effect. Um, and this is through uh, the enzyme uh, CYP2D6. Um, and interestingly, a subset of the population lacks this enzyme. So up between six and 10% of the population don't have the enzyme to convert uh, these medications to the active form. So that's, and you don't know really the, the genetic tests to, to test for that aren't routinely done. It's like a trial and error type of thing. So it's just something to be considering of, considerate of um, when you see doses being ramped up because it's not working, there could be a plausible explanation why it's not working. Another example of a medication um, that uh, has that same property is the tramadol. Um, it, it, it does have some analgesia, but the, uh, the metabolite um, that we rely on mostly is 200 times uh, more potent and has a higher affinity for the uh, opioid receptors than uh, the pro drug. So that's what uh, we should uh, keep in mind as well. There's, uh, so moving on to morphine, um, it's very common. Um, available in oral and injectable and um, long-acting formulations as well. Um, it can accumulate in renal failure, so we should be careful, and it does have active metabolites. But overall, it's uh, in the right dosing, it's uh, relatively safe, as is hydromorphone. It's a little, it's more potent than um, morphine, but um, at the right, again, at the right doses, it's one of the safer options as far as opiate goes for, uh, for geriatric population. And oxycodone, which again has an active metabolite and you'll see it uh, fairly uh, commonly. Tramadol and tepentadol, as I, I just touched on um, the metabolism of the tramadol. Uh, it's considered a, a weak opioid, whereas the tepentadol is more strong. Or, um, so it's, it's not, they're not covered by ODD and they, so the cost can add up if it's used for uh, long-term. Um, and there are some serotonergic and nor or norepinephric uh, effects. Um, next is uh, buprenorphine or butrans would be the uh, patch. Um, there also is also like uh, buprenorphine um, drops that are uh, available, but for the most part, you'll see the transdermal patch. Again, it's not covered by ODD. Um, and it's, I think it starts around 60, for the lower dose, it's around $60 a month, I wanna say. Um, now, it can be used in opioid naive patients. In fact, that's what it's recommended for. It gets complicated if the patient's already on higher dose opioids and you wanna put them on the Butrans patch. 
because it is a partial agonist. So they recommend weaning down the current opioid before you add it on because if you just slap on the uh, buprenorphine patch, you can get some withdrawal and uh, effects as well, or pain crisis effects. So it, it, like I say, it's not just a straightforward uh, transition. So be careful with that. Um, fentanyl, it's not for opioid naive patients. Um, it's very potent medication. Um, if for opioid tolerant patients, it's transdermal. There's injectable available mostly in, in the hospital, um, but um, it's, it's not something to start out on. And uh, you want to have to have intolerance with the higher doses of other opioids before you think about uh, using fentanyl. So overall, um, opiates, not surprisingly, do increase fall risk um, by the mechanisms of you know, causing sedation, uh, cognitive impairment, dizziness, um, you know, and you know, slowing of reaction time. Um, the, those are the, the primary mechanisms by which it would increase fall risk. Is also can increase fracture risk, but like if you compare it to NSAIDs, there's a hazard ratio of uh, almost uh, 4.5. So, in general, we uh, we want to start at a, a lower dose than the, our younger uh, patient population, usually about 50%. So, for instance, um, say hydromorphone, which is what we use a lot here, um, we would start at uh, 0.5 milligrams every you know 46 hours uh, as needed. Um, for, um, to try to get a, a sense of uh, when we're just starting out. And then once we get an idea of how much as needed, we can add on um, uh, regular dosing um, just to see, make sure they tolerate it. Now for frail or frail or more frail patients, so we would use uh, even lower of 0.25 milligrams. Um, which, you know, it gets tricky and kind of because uh, the smallest tablet the provided is the one milligram for the hydromorphone, so it's coming into quarters, or there is a liquid, but it seems to be chronically on back order. <laughs> so we have to uh, do the best we can with that. Um, so yeah, we monitor closely for uh, adverse effects with the opioids. Um, and they're, they're listed there. Respiratory depression is only uh, an issue with the higher dosing. Um, and especially if you ramp them up too quickly. So, but it's something to be uh, aware of and to, to watch out for. And constipation is a uh, one for common side effect for all the opiates. And um, if we're dosing the opiates regularly, there should be a corresponding laxative um, given uh, as well. Um, so, this is from a study um, in 2006 for, out of Denmark. It's a case control study that just showed that there is a significant infra fracture risk uh, with the uh, different opioids. Um, and you can see listed there the different uh, odds ratios of uh, fractures. Um, now, I guess the, the question is, was is it due to falls or was there a change in bone structure or why did they choose the fracture as an outcome. Um, but the, the time frame was, I believe uh, they were looking at was like 10 days. So there's no, there's no way that, you know, you can get a bone structure um, degradation in that short amount of time. So they, in the discussion, they attributed it to uh, falls for the most part. And, and unfortunately, hydromorphone wasn't uh, listed there. I don't know if they use, don't use a lot of hydromorphone in uh, in Denmark, but uh, uh, that would have been more helpful. But uh, you can predict that it would be the same as all the other uh, all the other opioids. Um, I just wanted to mention that there are um, Canadian opioid guidelines that were published in 2017, and this was a for the most part, it seems in response to the ongoing opioid crisis and how to try to limit um, opioids in the in increased patient safety in the community. Um, so these are some of the guidelines. It's not a comprehensive list. There is a bunch of, I think there are 10 or more um, uh, guidelines or uh, recommendations that they put out. 
But basically what they're saying is that when you're starting um, patients on opioids for non-cancer uh, or pain, then you want to go like 50, no more than 15 morphine equivalents a day. Um, and then that was a weak recommendation. And then you want to keep it under 90 milligrams when you're first starting out. That was a strong recommendation. Um, and then if your patient is already on opioids and they're taking more than 90 morphine equivalents a day, you wanna try wean them back down as much as possible um, They to, because um, the, the evidence that they had was that there's no um, good argument to having it above that um, for, for chronic non-cancer pain. Now there's limitations to these guidelines. Um, these aren't specifically for elderly patients. Um, and like I say, a lot of these were driven by overdose risk. Um, and basically the overdose risk was based on indirect evidence for opioid abuse risk. Um, and a lot of the uh, opioid efficacy trials are going to leave out or leaving out the substance abuse disorders and uh, psychiatric disorder patients uh, from their study. So it's not really uh, applicable as far as efficacy goes. Anyway, so, but yeah, you, again, you can go and Google and delve into this, um, but those are the, the three main ones that uh, uh, recommendations that I pulled out. So that was opioids. Now moving on to anticonvulsants. Um, so there's the gabapentin noise. So gabapentin and pregabalin, they work the, the same uh, way uh, on the calcium, uh, their calcium channel blockers. And there are also some um, serotonergic and uh, noradrenergic uh, pathways that are involved. So they're good for uh, neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia. Um, there is a risk of dizziness, drowsiness, and balance and uh, some weight changes. And we want to reduce dosing um, with if a patient does have a renal impairment. Um, as far as uh, fall risk, it's not well studied. These these drugs that I think were there's some observational studies, um, but no RTCs looking at, um, at at fall risk. But based again based on the um, the side effect profile. Uh, you can assume that our patients are at higher risk of, uh, of falls with these medications. Um, there is, like I say, there is reduced dosing with renal impairment. And so normally, say pre pregabalin, for instance, uh, the maximum dose would be 600 milligrams a day. And in in the, in the, in with moderate renal impairment, where you decrease to 300 milligrams a day. Um, and practically speaking, for the patients that we see, uh, we're going even lower than that just because they're coming to us with uh, maybe some cognitive imbalance problems. So we're going to try to cut back as much as possible, especially in the context that they can't really tell us a lot of the times if it's doing any good for them or not. So that's always a good indication. It's worth a try to try and decrease it. Uh, carbamazepine, it's a very old medication that's been around a long, has been around a long time. It's uh, useful for neuropathic pain. Specifically, that's uh, still used uh, for trigeminal neuralgia associated with, uh, with shingles. Um, and uh, there's uh, additional risk is uh, the risk of hyponatremia or SIADH uh, with it, which it can uh, potentially can increase uh, balance problems and so fall risk. You can do uh, levels uh, with it. And for neuralgia, I think you're looking at 10 to 25 micromoles um, range for, for efficacy for neurologists. So uh, epile epilepsy is a lot higher. Um, so if you're looking at top patients, keep it under, say, probably 40. But right. so just to be aware that it's something to uh, you can monitor. So the antidepressants. Um, more commonly used ones for our, for pain are the SNRIs, or which is the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, duloxetine and venlafaxine are the most common ones. They're good for neuropathic pain and uh, fibromyalgia. They're generally well tolerated. Um, 
you can get um, GI upset and headaches and dizziness. Um, there is a risk of falls associated with this class of medication. Um, and you have to be um, cautioned with uh, some drug interactions that um, you have to look at all the different sources of uh, serotonin uh, increase uh, the patient's taking. So the increased risk of serotonin syndrome, which um, would be high, you could be fever, seizures, irregular heartbeat, and unconsciousness. That's the, in general, what you'd be looking for. Um, the goal, what you want to do to try to avoid that is to start low and titrate up. Um, and so the, the next class of antidepressants, uh, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, they're not they're shown not to be effective for neuropathic pain. Well, oh, I should go back to, for the SNRIs, if there's a comorbidity of depression, so the antidepressants would be a good uh, choice for, for, for that patient. Um, so SSRIs, however, are, have really uh, been shown to be effective in neuropathic pain. So the dreaded TCAs are tricyclic antidepressants. Um, these are listed on beers and start stop criteria as far as being inappropriate, uh, potentially inappropriate for um, our older, uh, older patients. Uh, but they are very effective for neuropathic conditions, um, but it's the side effects that make them undesirable. So sedation, hypotension, and really the anticholinergic effects which can contribute to balance problems and um, increased falls, uh, as well as the uh, cognitive uh, issues that can happen. Um, and there are, like most medications, there are drug interactions we should be aware of. So in the other category, as far as medications um, for, for pain, muscle relaxants, um, cyclobenzaprine and methylcarbamol um, are examples. So, and there's like, weak to moderate evidence for, for relief of um, MSK pain. Um, so it's in the, they're non-specific effects that are, aren't really related to muscle relaxation. So they still have the pain, but they're, <laughs> they're drowsy. <laughs> I guess is how you'd uh, maybe word that. Um, and again, due to the anticholinergic effects, we uh, don't recommend them. Uh, in, our, in our patient population. They, and just a word of warning, again, you can get over-the-counter um, products, so you might not know your patient's taking them. Capsaicin cream um, has some shown to be some benefit in, for neuropathic and non-neuropathic pain by uh, depletion of substance P for the, for the pain relief. However, the tolerability is the, the kicker here. It's 30% um, of our patients don't really tolerate uh, the burning sensation associated when you're, they're putting it on. And it takes uh, like six weeks for it to do anything as far as the uh, pain relief goes. And it's not covered by ODB. So it's like the perfect storm of non-adherence <laughs> for, for that. Um, so, but if patients are desperate and they wanna try it, um, it's, uh, it'd, be, it'd be relatively safe as long as they can tolerate it. Um, cannabinoids, uh, this is the, the, the last group that I wanted to talk about. There's some evidence for uh, neuropathic pain, um, ca cancer pain, but not, uh, not acute pain. But however, it's not really well studied. It's kind of early days uh, for that. Um, there is an increased fall risk due to changes in depth perception, decreased reaction time, cognitive impairment, drowsiness, dizziness, as well as some cardiac effects. Um, and the risks do increase with the higher THC content, but CBD um, still poses a risk as, uh, by itself as well. Um, there is some topical uh, preps um, that are, can be compounded in the community by if you find the right pharmacy, uh, but it's like say it's early days for that. And as far as there's no RTC or randomized control trials, um, just the anecdotal case reports um, that uh, that you would see. So. Uh, agents that should be avoided in the elderly, um, outright, uh, meparidine, it's again, 
it's very, it's very old and it causes uh, CNS uh, excitation as well as uh, including seizures. Um, it can accumulate, it has active metabolites, uh, so the elderly are, are really at risk for that. Pentazacine, or Tallwin was the old name for it. I can't remember the last time I've seen that, um, but it's a mixed agonist antagonist and it can cause delirium agitation. Uh, on the NSAID side, we want to avoid um, endomethacin if we can, just because it has the highest incidence of uh, CNS uh, effects. Um, and finally, uh, Toralac, um, which um, is available in, uh, as injectable as well as oral, which kind of makes it unique for, for the NSAIDs. Uh, if you're going to use it, you should really limit the, uh, to the injectable um, when you don't have any other, uh, have an oral route available for any of the other NSAIDs and limit to like one dose if you, if you possibly can. Um, because there is a very high risk of GI bleeding with both uh, the uh, parental and the oral uh, formulations. So it's, uh, it's something that we want to avoid. So that's it. Uh, so basically, as a summary uh, for both Dr. Wong and myself, um, you know, pain is common and impacts the uh, quality of life, um, but it should be treated, not ignored. <laughs> Uh, both pain and pain medications used to treat pain can increase uh, the risk of falls. Um, so therefore, monitoring of the efficacy and the adverse effects is critical when you're prescribing, uh, when analgesia is, is prescribed. And finally, don't forget about the non-pharmacological uh, modalities uh, as part of the treatment plan. So when it comes down to it, it's, it's, it's a compromise between what you feel is the best strategy what you feel is the best strategy, what the patient is willing to take and what the physician feels comfortable prescribing. And those three things, and, and including the patient and the plan uh, to, uh, to have the best outcome possible. And that's, that's it. And I guess we can open it up for briefly for questions. Thanks, Derek. We're actually, we're at time. So um, I don't know if we'll be able to answer any questions live today, um, but I'll be able to uh, save all your questions, everyone, and, I'll, uh, and we'll get those, some, some written answers for you. Um, just want to quickly share a couple of housekeeping keeping items before we sign off. Um, I want to thank Derek and Shirley for this awesome um, start to the webinar series, Managing Meds and Minimizing Risk, uh, what you can do. Um, this really has set the stage and uh, will transition us nicely into our focus for the next um, webinar in the series, which focuses on deprescribing why, who, and how. And this will be part one uh, of the uh, deprescribing webinars. There'll be a second one in December that we can share more information with you at a later date, but uh, we'd love to see you all there. Um, like I said, you will be sent uh, a recording of the webinar. Um, we'll also be posting the slides on loop. Um, we'll get you some written answers to uh, the outstanding questions. Thank you so much for all your participation. And thank you again, Derek and Shirley uh, for a great presentation. Um, you will be, everyone, you'll be re redirected to um, an evaluation survey after we end the webinar. Um, so if you can fill that out so we can continue to um, be uh, putting on some great presentations for you, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you all again and have a wonderful day.